Looking out a year, though, the big issue is not the interbank lending rate. The big issue will be how large will the losses be going forward for U.S. banks on bad real estate loans. And the best estimates I can come up with are at least two or three hundred billion per annum for the next two or three years. And this could consume half of U.S. bank capital. So I think a big issue for the new American administration in January will be how do we protect the banks. I spoke at a conference yesterday with Paul Volcker in Florida. He publicly called upon the government to create a new organization like Resolution Trust, which we had to rescue the thrifts 20 years ago. This organization would basically buy hundreds of billions of dollars of mortgages off the banks, allowing them to get rid of high-risk assets, sell them to the government, and the government would then work out a solution over time. Maybe the government would engage in a lot of forbearance, not have as many foreclosures and defaults as would be the case if the mortgages were still privately owned. We don't yet have a clear policy, a clear strategy for this institution. But Volcker felt this crisis is so unprecedented, so severe, we will need, in the year ahead, further government intervention. Another possibility would be for the government to invest directly in the banks. Japan had a big banking crisis eight or nine years ago. At that point, the government intervened by buying preferred stock from Japanese banks, injecting trillions of yen of capital onto their balance sheets to allow them to work off what was also a huge stock of non-performing real estate loans. And now, eight or nine years later, Japanese banks are buying back this preferred stock, giving the government its money back. So a further possible solution could be for the government to invest directly in American banks to guarantee they have adequate capital to cope with their losses and so they won't have to go into default and into a receivership of the FDIC. In short, there's a great deal of debate now about the next stage of the crisis. It's too soon, I think, for the presidential candidates to have a clear view. I'd say, if anything, they were also overwhelmed by the events. John McCain has made some very populist comments overnight attacking Wall Street, greed and corruption. Obama has been very critical. But the reality is they haven't had time to work out a policy. But just three weeks ago, Larry Summers, who's a very influential Obama advisor and a former Treasury Secretary of the United States, had an article in the Financial Times calling upon the government to establish some kind of fund to rescue the banks. So prominent Democrats, as well as Republicans, are talking about possible solutions. I can also share with you some very interesting confidential information from my friends in the Obama camp. They tell me that Tim Geithner, the Federal Reserve Bank president, who's negotiated these big deals in the last few days, the rescue of AIG last night, the Bear Stearns rescue back in March, is now their leading candidate to be the new Treasury Secretary if they become the government of the United States next year. And Tim Geithner, I think, has demonstrated here in recent days, in recent months, a great capacity for rising to the challenge of trying to manage a financial crisis. And because of this experience, as well as his previous experience in Washington, many years at the Treasury as an international economist and so on, he could become, in January, Obama's Treasury Secretary if he indeed wins the election. So there's a great deal at stake, and there's many unanswered questions. The U.S. economy is weak. We had a very good second quarter, over 3% growth, because we had an export boom and we had tax rebates, $100 billion of tax rebates in May, June, and July, which helped consumer spending. But those tax rebates are now behind us, and it appears, based on preliminary data for July and August, that consumer spending in the current quarter may decline for the first time since 1991. Consumer spending has been under pressure because of the housing crisis, as well as the big increase in gasoline prices we had through June. The gasoline price increases, in fact, consumed two-thirds of the tax cut. Gasoline prices are now falling. They could fall by December back to $3 a gallon. If they do, that'll be a tremendous boost to the consumer going into Christmas. But right now, here in the third quarter, it appears we're going to have our first decline in consumer spending since 1991, and that means the overall growth rate of the U.S. economy here in the second half could be 1% or even less. In fact, I would not rule out the possibility here in the second half of a negative quarter. Now, the government two weeks ago nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And the government nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for three reasons. First, Morgan Stanley was brought in as a special advisor, and Morgan Stanley advised the government that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had bad counting that their balance sheet was overstating their real capital position. 
In fact, they didn't have as much capital as they claimed. Secondly, there was a great danger that foreign central banks might sell Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac securities because of fear about default. And foreign central banks over, own over a trillion dollars of these securities, so had they sold out, that could have had a very adverse effect on the American dollar. And thirdly, the government allowed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac back in February to lower their capital ratios to significantly expand their mortgage lending to help support the housing market. And because of all the turmoil we had this summer and their collapse in the share price, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were curtailing their lending in the month of July. The government, now that it's taken over, will try and use Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to bolster the housing market by increasing the lending. And in the last 10 days, mortgage rates in the U.S. have fallen 50 basis points because of this intervention. The Fannie Mae conforming mortgage rate has come down from 6.4 to 5.9. And yesterday, for the first time in several months, we had a survey of home builders that was a little bit optimistic. This tells us we may be close to finding a bottom in the housing market over the next three or four months. But because of what's happened to LIBOR in the last two days, we now have a new financial shock that may, in fact, partly offset this change with Fannie Mae and could have a very, very adverse effect on six million people who've got variable rate mortgages where yields could rise. So we still have tension here. We still have problems. But the government goal in nationalizing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac last week was to make sure it will play an effective role in trying to support the housing market. So once we get past this LIBOR crisis, this could be a positive for the housing market over the next three or four months. But because we have a large supply of unsold homes in the millions, because we've now got half the home sales in California tied to foreclosures, the same is true also in Florida, Nevada, and Arizona, the fact is we still have excesses from the old cycle we have to work off. And therefore, the Chicago futures market for house prices is projecting in the year ahead house prices could fall a further 9 or 10 percent. And that would mean that by the end of next year, our national house price index would be down 26, 27 percent. And in the hot markets of three years ago, California and Florida, we could be off 40 or 50 percent. So we still have in the housing market a lot of risk. We have the potential still for more loan losses. And this will be the great constraint on the U.S. economy as we go forward in the year ahead. I would have told you six months ago that while America was in trouble, we still had a remarkably benign global economy. Last year, the world economy had a growth rate over 5 percent. 120 countries had a growth rate over 4 percent. And several of the prominent emerging market countries like China, India, Russia had growth rates two and three times. They had growth rates of 12 percent, 8 percent, 9 percent. And the good news is the world economy still does have a fair amount of momentum. But the world economy has been hit here in the last four or five months by some pretty severe inflation shocks. We had up until June the big increase in the price of oil. We've also had large increases in the price of food. The price of corn and wheat is double what it was a year ago. The price of rice increased very dramatically in the first half of this year. And all these inflation shocks that hit the economy in the spring and summer did force the central banks in many countries, in Brazil, in Chile, in Mexico, in Vietnam, in Thailand, and the Philippines, to raise interest rates. And this will, in the year ahead, dampen their growth momentum. But if we look around the world, we will still see there are some very good growth stories. The best growth story in the world is still China. The growth rate's coming down. It was 12 percent a year ago. It'll be 10 percent this year. It could be 8 or 9 percent next year. China's had, in recent times, three major growth locomotives. They've had tremendous export growth. A few months ago, it was running at 30 percent. Now, with the world economy slowing down, that will come down, maybe to a growth rate of 15 or 20 percent. Not as buoyant as it was, but still pretty good. And China's emerged as a great, successful exporting nation because of China's ability to attract large amounts of foreign direct investment. Over the last 12 years, China's gotten over $700 billion of FDI, and the foreign firms go to China not just to sell for the local market, they go to China to use it as a global assembly point in their global manufacturing operations. 60% of China's exports are produced by foreign companies. Only 20 percent of the value added of Chinese exports accrues to Chinese companies. The other 80 percent goes to component suppliers in Malaysia, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Japan,
who are the big, big suppliers to China of all the components and all the parts they need to produce finished goods for the marketplace here in North America and Europe. China's second great growth locomotive has been capital spending. They've had a tremendous boom, not just in manufacturing, but in infrastructure investment. China's urbanizing now at the rate of 10 or 15 billion people every year. This means they have to build New York City every 12 months to accommodate the population flows. That's why China is now the dominant consumer of most commodities. China now produces half the world's cement. It consumes 30 percent of global copper output, the U.S. only 15. China now produces over 500 million tons of steel. The U.S. and Japan each produce 100 million tons. This is by far the greatest construction project ever known in human history. And because China is still talking about 300 million people leaving the countryside for the cities over the next 30 years, this construction project has many, many years to run and will be a tremendous source of growth stimulus for the economy of China. And the government's also embarking on massive infrastructure spending, adding literally thousands of miles of highway every year, new ports, new airports, a whole range of projects to go with these tremendous population flows. And the third growth locomotive is just plain consumer spending. China's had a huge improvement in living standards over the last 25 and 30 years. The goal of the Chinese consumer 30 years ago was to buy a sewing machine, a bicycle, a television set. The goal seven or eight years ago was to buy a cellular telephone. China now has over 500 million. And the goal today is to buy an automobile. Chinese auto sales are now running at seven or eight million per annum, compared to almost nothing 10 or 12 years ago. China now has 50 million automobiles. 10 years ago, it had 5 million automobiles. And Goldman Sachs is forecasting that by the year 2050, China could have 500 million automobiles. This is a very, very dramatic change in the world economy. It has profound implications for oil demand. It means we're going to be forced over the next 20 years to get rid of the internal combustion engine and go to a new technology because we simply won't produce enough oil in the world economy to accommodate this kind of growth in the Chinese car population. So Chinese consumer spending is also a very powerful growth locomotive which has many years to run because their living standards are still 15, 20 percent of ours. There's now an emerging middle class in the cities. They're making $20,000 a year compared to nothing 20 years ago. But those incomes will rise further to allow, over time, more convergence in lifestyle with the old industrial countries, with the US, Europe, and Japan.